Welcome to Tea Smack, home of the Tea Smack. May I take your order? Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Talking Smack, where we talk superheroes, movies, animation, and comics, and so much more. I am your host, Josh Scar. I introduced us very in, very introductorily, weirdly. I My words are lost all of a sudden. It's like I hit the record button and the, my brain just gets into word vomit. Uh, but I'm joined by Alex. Alex, how you doing? I'm doing pretty well. Since we're talking talking about so much more, I would like to discuss today the plight of the finch. The finch is an underappreciated bird, and I believe that we need to have a three-panel discussion about it, and I would like to introduce Matt. Matt, I believe you are taking the position that, in fact, finches can go fuck themselves. Is that correct? I Yes, uh, I'm here today to stand confidently and say that finches can, in fact, go fuck themselves in their own ears. Thank you very much for having me on today. <laughs> Thank you. It's a strong position. Josh, would you like to counterpoint? <laughs> no, finches kind of suck. <laughs> I don't know why he muted himself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that went off the rails really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't realize we were doing a debate. Sorry. I thought we were doing improv, which is a yes and process. <laughs> All right, next up, Starlings. Starlings and under <laughs> <laughs> Now, see, Starlings, though, they, they keep the sheep awake, and so they can go fuck themselves, too. <laughs> Matt, counterpoint. Uh, most winged creatures are uh, disciples of Satan, so I do believe that they deserve to burn as well. However, since Josh is going to take the stance that they need to die, I believe they need to live. Uh, their sounds <laughs> are a gospel from heaven, and they just keep the sheep uh, walking in a straight line. We need that. We need structure. Without structure, there's chaos. Without chaos... With chaos, there's disorder. Disorder brings the descent of all man. Birds, in general, need to be surviving to bring or organizational structure to, to man. There. Welcome to my TED Talk. Thank you. Point of order. Mm -hmm. Point of order. We're already living in the chaos times because, Matt, you're forgetting a very crucial element to the bird talk. Birds aren't real. Exactly. <laughs> Which brings us up to the representative for Vermont who would like to, <laughs> who would like to petition that the government should, re should install renewable batteries in the birds next time <laughs> actually it's me jesse ventura i'm here from minnesota and i'm here to <laughs> shut up monsoon <laughs> i don't got time to bleed <laughs> well to to clear up all this nonsense we are joined by matt from decaying with the boys he is returning after a, a pretty good hiatus if you are listening or a long time listener to the podcast you would know him from our upgrade review where we w did a, a looking back segment we reviewed an older movie that came out while the our podcast was on hiatus but matt how are you doing i'm doing really good it's nice to be back on with you guys uh josh of course it's always a pleasure to uh be on on your podcast i listen to it every week and when i was on hiatus uh, it was uh, it was something I look forward to every week. I love what you guys talk about, what you guys are picking apart. As my co-host would say, I was gone for nine months, so I had a child, and we are just doing so well together. And it's just really good to be back and to know that I have awesome podcasts that still want me to come on and chew it up with them about just about anything. So thanks again for having me on. Of course. And you're one of our favorite people, or at least one of my favorite people. I can't speak for Alex yet, but I'm sure by the end of this, Alex and I will be fighting over you like we've been fighting over Justin. Uh, but tell us a little bit about your podcast, Decaying with the Boys. So uh, we came back and really nothing's changed. We're going to still be that barroom chat, craft beer, combat sports, pop culture, horror movies, just by anything we're going to get our hands on. We're going to tear it up. But right now we are in the throngs of spooky season. So we are sipping on pumpkin latent beers, just destructive stouts. And we're bitching about horror movies and pitting uh, just villains against each other and trying to bring in guests and scare the shit out of them. So you can find us on all social media. We're decaying WTB on everything, including X. And you also <laughs> subscribe to us on YouTube. Every subscription helps me, not anybody else, but you know, help me out. <laughs> Yeah. So I, I've I had the thought this weekend that um one of my I'm a Packer fan, just to get it out there. One of my favorite Packer websites, uh Cheesehead TV, they actually created their own beer last year that was regionalized to the state of Wisconsin. 
And I believe this year they went at least stateside wide. The beer is called Carry the G. And I'm like, I wonder what Matt would think of this beer. Because every, I don't drink beer. So every person I see is like a Cheesehead TV fan. So like, oh, it's the best beer ever. I'm so glad I found it. I'm just like, I wonder what these connoisseurs of liquor would think. I would say it's it's always great when someone uses the word connoisseur because I always tell them you're mixing up alcoholic and connoisseur. However, <laughs> I do like to dabble in uh, very area specific beers, and I'll just say this, and this is across the board: any NHL, NFL, NBA, MLS, any team that's ever been like, "This is our beer." Your beer sucks. Every single one of them. <laughs> if if it's your beer and it's made, it's made for my team. It's terrible. I'm sorry. I've never even had it, but I'm gonna just fancy to say. It's probably trash, and that's okay. <laughs> Enjoy it. Drink it. Root for the Packers. Aaron Rodgers is dead to you guys, and he's also dead to the Jets too, which is pretty cool. So he, He's dead to on. the league this year, essentially. <laughs> but we're not here to talk about sports. We're here to talk about assignments. More specifically, we're here to talk about uh, adaptation assignments. But first, we're going to hear from our friends Joey, Tim, and Slade over at the Game Club Pod. We'll be right back to talk about movies and TV shows that miss the assignment. Join me, Joey, and my co-hosts, Tim and Slade, at the Game Club Podcast, where every two weeks we review video games not too dissimilar from a book club. Looking forward to seeing you there, idiots. Yeah, you stupids. Tim, do you want to jump in on this? I will not bandwagon all these (laughs) abuse. Thanks for not calling us stupid, Tim. We appreciate it. All right. So, gentlemen, let's let's dive into this. So we, we had a really good response to our rent free episode, which we've had quite a few listens to as well. So thanks, everyone, for your participation and listening. The idea behind this one is we've all heard the phrase you you had one job. You, they missed the assignment. And I wanted to put a little twist on it because obviously we're in this era of Hollywood where everything is getting adapted like there's very few ideas that are like I had this idea for a movie I had this idea for a TV show it's all just adapted rebooted whatever so with that in mind did they hit their assignment sometimes yes sometimes no sometimes they improved on the assignment so I want to talk about that and uh we'll we'll just rip the band-aid off right here and now miss the assignment Me, it's DC's Titans. I've talked about it for two years. It is one of, in my opinion, one of the worst superhero adaptations, which we'll get to another bad one here. But overall, DC's Titans just, it does not understand superheroes. And I've used this before. I believe it's in season three. There's a scene where Starfire is yelling at Dick Grayson, Nightwing, about how Jason Todd has become a killer. And we're not killers. Heroes don't kill. Whatever. And then in the very next scene, she goes and confronts someone who's working for her sister and incinerates that person. She shakes their hand and just sets them ablaze. Some hero she is. And like, what leg does she have to stand on for telling Jason Todd we don't kill? We're not vigilantes like that. What the hell are you doing, people? So that's a big misassignment. So, Josh, I would like to counterpoint that, of course, she does not have a leg to stand on. As we all know, Starfire floats. Well, flies, <laughs> floats, floats implies like hovering, like she's just a few inches off the ground. She can fly. She can move around, but she can also stand. I mean, if you must, according to the lore <laughs> of Teen Titans Go, she always she and Raven are always just hovering. They're just floating there in space. So that's why she doesn't have a leg to stand on. Now, you mentioned DC's Titan. What? service is that on is is that something that's actually watched well that launched on dc universe that was the one of the the launching points for that app which was also meant to be like a competitor to marvel universe but they were like hey we're gonna have swamp thing which that's when i could add to this swamp thing (laughs) nailed the assignment swamp thing hit that assignment hard the only problem is they spent too much money Like Swamp Thing A plus, I I could not recommend that show enough, and that's that's kind of a spooky show. So spooky season, I can I can do that. Mm-hmm. But to answer your question, it's on the artist formerly known as HBO Max. Oh, okay, cool. I I tried like an episode and a half of that, and I was just like, I understand that they hire the best of the CW CW scriptwriters to do that show, and by hiring the best of the bottom of the barrel, that does not elevate your property. So I just never gave it a go. <laughs> I just can't. 
it's a bunch of edgelord bullshit because there i mean the thing that was meant to hook viewers into the show was the the scene in the trailer where robin brenton thwaites pops up and he goes fuck batman (laughs) which that wasn't that was a dream sequence by the way that wasn't even something that actually happened in the show besides the fact that it happened on screen it was just a dream sequence so like it really technically never happened he's just having a bad dream because he's like oh man what if i become as bad as batman and like i I don't know. DC is in this weird Snyderverse state where like Batman had to be killing people, but it completely breaks his character. So like, I, I don't know. We'll get into it a little, a little bit later, but uh, Matt, as the guest, I'll let you go second. Like who, what is something that comes to mind or from the list that we have here? What is something that pops out to you as a, a, a property that missed the assignment? So I was looking at a couple of these and the one that really caught my eye that I want to defend here is I'm seeing that Ash versus Evil Dead made the list of products that, that missed the mark. I have to say here that Ash versus Evil Dead is a fantastic show from the very first moment to the last moment it was aired and i will defend it until it dies it doesn't matter because after three seasons (laughs) oh you say hopefully i say it's gonna get resurrected so when when you look at this thing it's schlocky it's stupid it's gory it's deadites it's what you want from an evil dead movie with bruce campbell in it it's not the new age, evil dead, edgy, bloodbath, blood raining from the heavens kind of thing you're looking for. It's quite literally the continuation of the Ash story through Bruce Campbell's eyes. It's meta. It's meta as fuck. And that's why I love it. <laughs> See, I subscribe to stars for that show. Like, that's the only reason I did. And I kept it around through the end. Literally the day after the show ended, I canceled my subscription. <laughs> Now, the reason why Ash vs. Evil Dead misses the mark, and this is solely, this, this, this hurts, but it's Lucy Lawless's fault. <laughs> <laughs> she came onto the show as, uh, as Ruby, who was like, I, I believe the daughter of the original cabin owner who did all that stuff. And then it turns out she's some kind of secret deadite and they have to fight her, but then they don't, but then she disappears, but she has to have regulated five minutes per episode because that was in her contract as a New Zealander. And if you film something in New Zealand, she's obligated to be on your show. And her continuing presence and reoccurring, and, and reoccurring theme in the show is what actually broke me. And I'm like, this is not what the show is about. The show is, as you said, supposed to be schlocky, dumb. It's about Ash, Ash's dad literally being Lee Majors, which had been a joke forever. <laughs> and it's about his, you know, his surrogate family that... And, but then it turns out he actually has a real daughter floating around out there that I that didn't work for me at all. I love the Evil Dead movies and I I love Ash, but they had no f- focus. And then by trying to back uh, ask backwards, find a kind of theme and a reason for these characters to just survive and keep going, it ruined it for me because it was just like. Okay, so we have a Bruce Light episode if we're going to focus on Ruby for a little while. And then this character who was supposed to be dead is actually still alive again. All right, so we got to kind of fumble around a little bit. And all right, yep, mm-hmm, same story, different day. You're just wandering in circles. But thankfully, somebody remembered to bring the 55-gallon drum of blood to the set today. So at least I have that going for me. <laughs> I'll, I'll make a quick rebuttal, Your Honor, if I may. Um, That's you, Josh. I'm going to allow this. Uh, he has a chainsaw for an arm. End of argument. So we can move <laughs> on. Uh, <laughs> you have to look past some of the bullshit and it's there. And I completely agree with you. There are some things to try to like just wedge into the story, but the nostalgia of it and the desire for it to be what it is kind of helps me put the blinders on just enough where I was able to wait till it came on Netflix and I binged it. Of course, like everybody else did, it didn't subscribe to Stars. I'm sorry for your loss that you had to cancel that subscription because it's a wonderful production company. But if I could, I, I would, if I could go and get the memory erasing thingy from Men in Black, I would only use it for one thing. And it's not to see the birth of one of my daughters, it's to go back and watch Ash versus Evil Dead for the first time. So I love that show. <laughs> 
Hey, I I love where it ended. I was sad I got uh I was sad I got canceled. And actually, I think you had the better viewing experience because I was suffering through three years of fourteen ninety nine a month because I was too dumb to cancel and had to travel from you know from October of twenty fifteen all the way through May of twenty eighteen to get to the show. And I think that is what probably bothered me is that it was like a year, year and a half later each time. It's like okay, cool. Where are they going? they're all back okay so we got to go through this again i think a like a nice two and a half week you know quick binge of it probably would have raised the steam but i honestly did you like the new evil dead movie because i actually dug it i thought i thought it was yeah. interesting what they were attempting oh i loved it yeah no it's so my thing is with horror movies horror anything i like to subscribe to everything the only thing that i don't get a kick out of is the overuse of jump scares that's the only thing in horror movies and horror shows i just don't like don't scare me just because you want to scare me build something or do something or have a love letter to special effects and i think the the newest iteration of evil dead evil dead rise we're talking about correct of course um yeah i love it was such a I like to use this word. It's an amalgamation of what people want to see with that level of horror. You got great suspense. You have atmospheric suspense and build up great score. You have buckets of blood. You have all the rules are getting broken because spoiler alert, kids get hurt in this one. Um, I mean, you, you see it all. So I really, really enjoyed that movie because it, it, when horror movies break the boundary lines, like uh, terrifier did art, the clown, without speaking a single word breaks the fourth wall at all times and breaks all the rules of horror. I like that the most just punch horror right in the mouth and make everyone look at it. Yeah. Uh, that's actually why I love the first episode so much is in the last episode is the first episode, especially because Sam Raimi directed it and wrote it. And you can tell that he is in, con is in control of his craft because just from the beginning the utilization of a spinning flashlight to provide the sole source of light to a room as this dead eye is approaching to it to attack this person is everything I needed. Cause I'm like, there is the master in action. He has one room, two people, a spinning flashlight. And that's all we need for terror and horror and funny and, and funny. And that's what I love. That's why I loved um, Dr. Str uh, Dr. Strange too so much is, Sam Raimi just knows how to have fun with his characters. Punish them severely, but have fun. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Josh. Before uh, Matt and I get lost to turning this into the Bruce Campbell Appreciation Hour, would you like to, <laughs> to change the topic? Well, you you haven't you haven't said one yet, unless you're you're jumping on Matt's bandwagon with just talking about Evil Dead. So I will do one of mine. Pacific Rim Two. Pacific Rim is a fantastic movie directed by Guillermo del Toro that gave us larger than life props. They actually built the uh, the, the Jigers, the the room that they're in. They actually had to move, physically removing the set with the contraption they were stuffed into. It gave us a story with heart and hope and fun and just stupidity, like using an oil tanker to beat to death a giant monster <laughs> with a giant robot. And it also gave us Mako Mori, which was a fantastic lead that is female. Her story arc is not, I must fall in love with the dude from Sons of Anarchy. It's more just like they were really good friends and they just mentally bond well and appreciate each other. And then in Pacific Room 2, they decided to get rid of Guillermo del Toro, get rid of the Sons of Anarchy guy, and say, you know what we should do with this, with this character? We should have her blow up in a helicopter after being a being a bit of a jerk <laughs> for about 45 seconds on screen and then suck it all away for some horrible, stupid, tropey love story bullshit. But that's not why we're there. We're there for robot fights and kaiju fights. And, and they, they make a really, mecha kaiju. And they were really bad. <laughs> yeah, no. Pacific Rim 2 was very disappointing in, in pretty much all facets. They didn't even make a Voltron like that's Everyone. the logical that's that's the logical step in this where you have the kaiju make a voltron you figure out how to make your own voltron <laughs> exactly you need a voltron and i hate to say this but you know what was better than pacific room 2 pretty uh, much everything else well a, a movie called <laughs> atlantic rim which was so sci-fi knockoff isn't it good <laughs> so good i love that movie. <laughs> 
that thing. All right, I'll, I'll let you nerds go on that again. Oh, <laughs> that movie decided to take all the things that Pacific Rim Two missed and just took it all and was like, "All right, you suck. Move aside." And it's like, we don't need an A list <laughs> director. We don't need Charlie Day. We nope. don't need any of that crap. Mm-mm. We're just gonna have bomb ass kaiju's and we're gonna have them go against mecha swords and we're just gonna throw the fuck. Out. It was so good, man. It was, it was all at. It was gas, 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 no breaks. That's mm-hmm. what I wanted. It was beautiful. <laughs> almost as good as Santa Jaws. Almost as good. <laughs> <laughs> almost. Almost. <Yes. laughs> Josh, Santa Jaws is a is a movie set in the Louisiana Bayou in which Santa gets killed and the Santa hat lands on a shark and he becomes Santa Jaws. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the Santa Claus, but with a shark. And the shark eats people because he has yeah. Santa's powers. <laughs> Yeah, instead of Tim Allen okay. eating people, it's a shark. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, well, let's start getting into some listener submissions uh, from Nicole D. She submitted the Disney Plus exclusive uh, Chippendale Rescue Rangers from 2022. She wrote, and again, this is why I don't read scripts, so I apologize in advance. I feel like a positive one is Chippendale Rescue Rangers 2022. That movie came out of nowhere. It's really niche and it had no right being as fun and enjoyable as it is. How much money did they spend on that? How did they get it? How did they even get it made? Who greenlit this? Why was it catered directly to me? How did they know? Why is it so good? I love it. It's so good. It hit every mark and I have zero idea how it got made in in Disney's current age of extended universes and live action remakes. Incredible. For the most part, I agree with that. Um, I think the movie is very average, but I think that's kind of what they're going for because it is very meta in the sense of what it's trying to do. I think the only thing I have a problem with still is Andy Samberg and John Mulaney as the voices. Like, give me Corey Burton and Tress McNeil and pitch their voices up. Like, that's all I want. And and that movie would have been perfect, in my opinion. But I, I think other than that, like, you, you can't not watch that movie and be like, Ugly Sonic was stupid. Like, Ugly Sonic was a scene stealer, in my opinion. I loved that this was one of those movies that was happening around the same time that Disney, I like to call it the greenlit era. You could pitch anything during COVID. And it was like, yeah, it's not Marvel, but we'll be fine. This will work. And this is exactly what that is. This movie is, it, it's not memorable. It's not forgettable. It's kind of rewatchable. If you have some kids around and you know, you're safe, you can put it on. Like if you need to like sit your kids down in front of something that's like, you know, TV Xanax and you can put that on and they'll chill you know, they're not going to go off on some weird tangents or try to like do say and do weird shit on the television. So that description is hundred percent, right? How did it get to be so on the money, so safe, but so fun. It wasn't a Marvel movie. It wasn't a reboot of something like ostentatious or anything. So I was like, I like, I actually just watched it not too long ago. <laughs> yep. So I'd, I'd recommend watching it just to, to watch it. Uh, Monterey Jack is essentially a coke head um, because he has a cheese problem. Um, They use his cheese as an allegory for a drug problem. And uh, yeah, it's it's fun. That's all I can say. Like, this is what I kind of wish the Chippendale, uh, not the Chippendale Rescue Rangers, the Alvin and the Chipmunks movies ended up being uh, because it does kind of just take the idea that like, oh, these guys were TV stars and now they're doing the Comic-Con circuit because retro is back. It's it's a lot of fun. I, I can't I can't say Nicole is wrong in this opinion. Matt, how about you? What stands out to you here? So I'm looking over here, and I want to I wanna say the one that I know I get a lot of nerd hate for, because I'm that guy, but the one that's hitting the good mark from a, from a listener, Mr. Uh, Ollie Badrick, saying the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Uh, Lord of the Rings is another example of uh, missing the assignment in a positive way. Most of the characters have changed. A lot of the nuance of the book has been simplified, mainly just to keep the runtime down and the tone is very different from the book. But the movies are incredible, so I'm certainly not complaining. I'm complaining because the books Uh are incredible. The books are incredible. (laughs) I've never, never been a fan of the movies, and I know that 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 hurts. Someone wants to come take my 20-sided die. You can take it from my cold dead hands. (laughs) All right, I'm a D&D nerd. I love 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 this trilogy of books but for some reason i couldn't get down with the movies um even though they said it's simplified to keep the runtime down you simplified out some of the coolest shit but when you simplify uh, i'm sorry to interrupt you i'm going through my 3.5 dungeon masters guide real quick i'm pretty sure if you see 
on page 15, handling PC actions. I do get to remove you from the table for being a disruptive influence <laughs> and <laughs> and annoying the other players. Please leave. Uh. <laughs> Well, the world of Uno, I'm pulling out a reverse card, sir, <laughs> and I've handed it to you, and I am now the dungeon master. You may be excused. <laughs> well, and you can be just like the Lord of the Rings movies. You can keep walking. Just walk for roughly 12 <laughs> hours. Just Even the trees walked, to quote Clerks 2. <laughs> even the trees walked. Come on. It's, it was too sloggy. It was too slow. And and I know at the KNWTV come after me because i don't like the deaf tones i don't like lord of the, lord of the rings i'll fight i fight all the time <laughs> oh man you guys going after the deaf tones which i found that extra hilarious that you guys were talking about new metal because we had uh slade uh at game club pod did, uh, we did between two pods and he had asked us like is uh lincoln park the best new metal band of like 2001 or whatever it was i didn't realize new metal was like nu metal and not new metal oh my god you didn't like know not, that <laughs> i didn't know that was a i didn't know that was a genre so like i'm like no that's not a they're not metal no like that's not what that is <laughs> and i think lewis did the, had the same reaction because i think that's when lewis came onto the podcast and he, he's just like fuck no no <laughs> I, I my my problem with them is that i would not consider them new metals as of their second album meteora that was my problem with it just because they you know we're not going back into this discussion damn it no <laughs> the lord of the rings but the extended trilogy <laughs> is almost perfection and i am oh, okay. so ashamed that you would dare to s- yeah there's a lot of walking anyway but the point part <laughs> is the best okay a lot of the best parts are actually in the extended edition and not the actual oh, okay. the, re- t- the theatrical version i mean hmm. you know aragon's that's something back, aragon's back sorry but you you know it, it's better than the hobbit i have to hold to that okay <laughs> okay i'll give you that but just because let's go back to the thing you said before just because you get the bottom of the barrel to go to something new doesn't make it better than the original shit Okay, it okay. doesn't matter. <laughs> That's also my argument for Zack Snyder's Justice League. Just because it's better than the Justice League doesn't mean it's good. It's shit. <laughs> Although I love the Lord of the Rings because that was my introduction to the Lord of the Rings. Like I remember my dad heard me ask, can we go see the Lord of the Rings? And he's like, oh, I didn't know they made that into a movie. I loved those books as a kid. And then we went and saw them and I like found the trilogy of books at our borders. And yeah, I've, I've been a nerd. Like, I mean, I've been a nerd since like 1989, but that like that just kept digging me deeper i, I actually hate the lord of the rings box <laughs> see I there you go no see my friend you know the trailer came out for it i was like i i know i've vaguely seen these like these books my friend gave them to me and so i i got maybe a third of the way to the first one i'm like where is the where is the dictionary for this elvish shit why is there four pages in elvish and i and, and there's no description there, there's no translation who is this tom bombadil guy and why is what i think his wife is hidden on frodo and he left and then i got to the, you know, in the book i'm like no i don't want to do this i, I just don't i i don't <laughs> and then i saw the movie i'm like this is an improvement this is a vast improvement okay i'm gonna i'm gonna finish i'm gonna finish the books and then i got midway through the last book and they had destroyed the ring and then it keeps going and going and going and there's more elvish and there's a eulogy across 10 pages that isn't described at all and it isn't translated and i'd have to go find something called the cimmerillion which apparently there's a wrong order to read that and he didn't even finish it his son did and his son is saying he cobbled it together from letters his dad sent him, which I'm like, how do you have copies of letters your dad sent? Oh, fans sent him back to you. Okay, cool. Or they apparently use fax machines and I can find the translations in there. And then they kept going and then they burned down the Shire and then they're all taller now and they're all having lots of babies. And for some reason, I need to know that this guy got elected mayor and had six kids. But then he's like, you know what? I hate my wife. I'm going to go to see Frodo one more time. And then they sailed on a boat that kind of went west or went, maybe went east. I don't know. But the elves are dead, but they're not because there's the, the Forever Lands or the Undying Lands or whatever. And I'm like, and I finished it. And I went, thank you, Peter Jackson, for distilling the essence of this shit down to something palpable that I can love and adore. And you know what? Thank God a lot of this stuff is in the public domain so D&D could rip it off. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's why I love those movies. Wow. If if I had the time to make that into a TikTok, I might. <laughs> <laughs> Ollie, thank you so much for your submission. Um, we we might have broke Alex with that one. But in in the in the interest of continuing arguments, in my opinion, a good adaptation that hit missed the assignment but improved on the source material, similar to what Alex is alluding to with Lord of the Rings, Jurassic Park. Cinematic masterpiece, Jurassic Park, 1993. Steven Spielberg just knocked it out of the park. Fantastic movie. Perfect. Doesn't dive too deep into sci-fi bullshit. And Alex, please tell me why I'm wrong. So this... I'm not wrong. Yes. So this is (laughs) shows and movies that miss the point. I would like to point you towards IMDb where there is a list of credits. In those credits, there is somebody named Phil Tippett. Now, Phil Tippett is listed as Dinosaur Supervisor. He missed the mark on that. They went rampant. They ate people. They killed people. They broke free. He missed his assignment. And because he missed his assignment, we had to watch these poor children being chased and hunted and sneezed on and cars being flipped and sexy Jeff Goldblum being injured and being spritzed offset by Steven Spielberg to get that glistening chest for that one perfect moment. (laughs) And then Hammond being so rude as to roll out maps across his injured legs and the pain (laughs) he was in. And you know what? I do want to hear that discussion that Ellie has about men and women in survival situations that we never got to finish. And I think that is missing the assignment. It's because of Phil Tippett that these dinosaurs were injured and we not, never got to hear Ellie's diatribe. And that is why it's a, and that is why I missed the assignment, sir. I'm sorry, you've missed the assignment because whose fault is it? It's John Hammond's fault for not paying his people. Dennis Nedry would have never gone rogue had he been paid fairly for his work. I contend, sir. That- Hashtag support the writer's strike. <laughs> Hashtag support the actor's strike. I will contend, sir, that Phil Tippett was hired by Steven Spielberg, and that is why those dinosaurs went went, went wild. <laughs> psyop he's a plant <laughs> <laughs> so you're taking the 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 twitter troll approach of yes. steven spielberg hunted down this animal he should be barred from directing a movie in hollywood and it's a picture of him in front of the triceratops if it's the last say triceratops and he hunted it down for the movie <laughs> he filmed its dying breaths <laughs> Oh, is that why he produced the water horse so he could kill the last uh, Nessie? Mm-hmm. Oh, you're damn right. <laughs> That's why he Nessie hasn't been seen in about thirty years. Follow the money, Josh. Yeah, he got burned. for a movie Steven Spielberg didn't actually make or produce that I'm just trying to make a joke out of. Twenty five <laughs> years later, <laughs> Jurassic Park is a precious, lovely, timeless movie. The, in my opinion, the book and the movie are of equal standings. The movie is a good, like Lord of the Rings, a good distillation of the essence and themes of the book turned into a palpable (laughs) palpable mass-produced product that it can be consumed. And the book is a lovely sci-fi horror novel that scares the crap out of me because the goddamn raptors can have their legs blown off and still will chew your ass off when you're hiding in a water, you're hiding in a sewage (laughs) pipe. (laughs) Yeah, and Starship Troopers is a love story. Just stop it, dude. (laughs) You can't tie crap to good stuff and say that it's all good. Don't do that. Hey, listen, Starship Troopers can be defended because it's a fun movie because it's the first time. I, never mind. Going to back away. <laughs> I'm editing myself. It's the first myself. time I saw boobs. <laughs> That's a Patreon episode right there. Keep it going. <laughs> Lots of them when I was like 13. <laughs> and I was like, mm. <laughs> they're showering. I remember looking over at my dad like, am I allowed to be here? It's like, you're a man now. This is where, <laughs> this is where it happens. <laughs> He should have said, son, would you like to know more? (laughs) (laughs) Swipe now to learn more. (laughs) Uh, All right, Matt, what's next on what's next that pops out at you? I really enjoy the fact that you decided that World War Z sucked because it did. Everything about that movie sucks. Um, That that so bad. It's so bad. That adaptation. The book is beautiful it's fantastic make a mockumentary and or like just make make a movie that has narration over it or something i don't know there's plenty of opportunities to make a faithful adaptation of world war z instead what do we get we get brad pitt running around for a pepsi or some shit and 
with weird running zombies and they they find a cure. I don't even remember. It, it's a, it's an extraordinarily forgettable movie yeah. that is just used as a vehicle for Brad Pitt and like they wanted the name they wanted the name more than they wanted the story. World War Z, fantastic book. Couldn't put it down from the moment I picked it up. And when I saw the movie was being made, I'm like, oh, I can't wait. Because I thought for sure, too, it's going to be like gorilla behind the scenes kind of thing. Almost like Diary of the Dead, their old Romero movie. I was like, this is going to be cool. It's a huge budget. It's based off an incredible book. So this is going to be so good. And I swear to God, the moment I saw that Brad Pitt was cast as the lead, I was like, this is going to suck. I'm still going to go watch it because I love zombie movies. And I always have a crush on Brad Pitt because who doesn't? And then I went and I was like, mm, it's exactly what I thought it was going to be. And I just, I wa- I stayed because I'm cheap. So I stayed for the whole movie. So I'm not going to walk out because I get the popcorn for free with it. When the, the movie, theater, never mind. But I stayed for the whole thing. Popcorn was delicious. You go in early and steal someone else's popcorn. That's how the deals work. Well, because yeah. if you go, if you go in, they have popcorn sitting in the seats when you sit down. So that's what you, and there's pop too, like so- soda. And those are for free. I don't know why people wait in line. People go in line, they yeah. wait for so long, and they pay. When you can just go right into your seat, and it's right there <laughs> waiting for you. Like I, suckers, dude. And that's why you know I'm early bird gets the worm. <laughs> World War Z, the book has two of the most terrifying passages. One is not even one of the stories, which it's just talking about the fact that no one has heard from or gone to North Korea since it all broke out. But all they know is that it is that they had a, a bunker and they went into it and they, they have not heard sound since. And I'm like, Oh, mm, <laughs> what is in that bunker? <laughs> Who's going to open it first. <laughs> and then I will never forget the story about the survivor, like crawling to freedom from like the tree and how that ends is it's it could be a fantastic like 12 part miniseries of this just a reporter collecting stories for a book called war war z or some crap like that it could even be done as an anthology movie like what is that one the halloween one like trick or treat from like 15 years ago that was like an anthology uh, anthology um or you know, something from the 80s, the Twilight Zone anthology movie. You can do something interesting with it. Hollywood's not interested in no. interesting. No. <laughs> it, it Swing and a miss, sir. Yeah, uh, it's one of the most like it, it, it creates such an atmosphere. The book does where like I still have like vivid memories of picturing the, the scene where the person is describing seeing a zombie for the first time. And it's like chained up, but it's like just lunging at them and it's such a good book like i if even if you don't like scary stuff like it's not that scary but it does create like i said a a great atmosphere and you you're reading it like a a newspaper article essentially because it's written in a a way that's like first-hand accounts or second-hand accounts to the narrator of the story and like you said you could make it a a 12 episode anthology show and you use the interview as a framing device, then you fade into the background like Rose and Titanic and you start the episode and it, it, it works. It writes itself. And we, again, we got some schlocky color by numbers, action horror movie, which like, is it until it gets to the scene where he gets the Pepsi? Is it really a horror movie? <laughs> like, I just remember he's drinking the Pepsi. He's like, Oh God. And then they're like, Oh, Hey, a little bit of tension. And then we're cured. Mm-hmm. On the flip side of that, a good a good zombie adaptation from a, a short film from the BBC is Black Summer on Netflix. That is one of the best zombie apocalyptic shows. I mean, I I think there's two or three seasons. It is hands down my favorite. To hell with the Walking Dead, Z Nation, all that stuff. See you later. All those adaptations. Those missed the mark. Bye. Black Summer, that's my stuff. I'll, I'm going to start rewatching. I just reminded myself, I'm going to start watching it tonight. I'm going to put the first episode back on. It's so <laughs> good. So good. I haven't watched it in a while, but um, the movie Quarantine is one of those like sleeper found footage movies that I feel like should be more talked about. It's not great, but I do think they do the found footage stuff really well, and it's it does zombie stuff really well. Like My head canon is it's the... Uh, the preamble to the left for dead games. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
Now, did you watch Quarantine or did you watch the original 2007 Spanish film it's based off called Rex? That's right. It is an adaptation. I've watched all six movies, sir. I've watched all six. <laughs> You've watched all, all six? Th- all three Spanish Ooh. movies and all three American movies. I've watched all of them. <laughs> Do they diverge? Because Rec and Quarantine are almost shot for shot in many yeah, cases. Yeah, so after that, it's a huge split. I mean, it's the by the time you get to the end of the Rec series, you, you're you so in, ingrained in the lore of it. And they it's it's three different movies, three different scenes, and you're st- and you're learning about the infection as it goes. Spoiler alert: it's demons, which is really cool. So you have the the high rise in like an urban setting. Then you have a boat in the second one, and then you have a wedding in the third one. Each one is just amazing. Great special effects, great storytelling, super tense. And then like, and of course, the third one's kind of like goof shoes, like very silly goose time but it's so good so it also bride with a chainsaw slowly turning takes out the takes out the undead so cool sounds like uh ash williams wedding bride with a chainsaw all right josh i'm looking here at this list and i see casting views dan has decided to besmirch us in fact any perhaps person within their 30s by saying that the flintstones was a poor adaptation as a live action movie. Now I will contend that Lost in Space is probably accurate. Anytime you have, oh Joey yeah, there's Ch- no argument about Lost in oh, Space. Yeah. I mean, Joey Tribbiani did not do that movie well. But when you have Dan, mm-hmm. when you have Babe Ruth as the Fred Flintstone, <laughs> just yeah, how it was good. How, are they are they saying the second one? Maybe the second one where they went to go eat at Stonehenge. Maybe that one was not. Dan good. said the Flintstones. I, I assume he meant the the Harold Ramis as Barney, Rosie O'Donnell as Betty, and John Goodman. I'm forgetting who played Wilma. She's really well known too Katie at the time. Siddell? But was, was it Renee Zellweger? <laughs> no, it was definitely not Renee Zellweger. <laughs> Flintstones. Let's see. 1994, The Flintstones. Uh, Rosie O'Donnell. Elizabeth Perkins. She was Wilma. And Elizabeth Taylor played her mom, Pearl Slaghoople. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like, I, I don't know how you look at that cast alone and be like, no, that's that movie was shit. There's practical effects. I believe Steven Spielberg adapted that one, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was produ- producer on it. Um, but it, it's got satire. It's got like a Wayne's World vibe to it. It's got heart. It's sincere and it's fun and it feels like the Flintstones for the most part. Like they're, they've got the, it's a living moments and it's just, I think it's great. I love that movie. I go back to it probably once every two or three years, just cause I, I don't think it's that rewatchable, but it is really fun and say what you will about Halle Berry's Catwoman suit. Let's talk about her Flintstone suit. Thank you very much. <laughs> Miss Sharon Stone. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, I, I would say if I was going to take a crap on a Flintstones movie, Viva Rock Vegas is the one where I'd be like, now you've, you've jumped the rock shark. I'm done with this. It's the first one. Isn't that one. the one with one of the Baldwin, Billy Baldwin as, uh, as Barney? Yeah. Yeah. They recast. I didn't like it. Hey Fred, just try. I don't know. He's talking from the top of his head. I don't like it. <laughs> no, Her- uh, Rick Rick Moranis as Barney was fantastic. Oh, so good, and it's you, you can't beat that because Rick Moranis and his prime is better than any other comedic actor of modern time. Too, Rick Moranis was the man, and I wish he would have had more time in Hollywood. But uh, I love Dan from casting views, but he's so wrong. He's mm-hmm. so wrong. The he's he's so very good. he's fifty percent wrong on this one because yeah. Lost in space, like there's a reason that one has just disappeared beyond like deep nerd annals of like, hey, look at how horrible CGI used to be. <laughs> I just look at this like, weird monkey. The director just like has a glass of water from him. He's like, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna tip this over and we're all gonna scatter. Okay, here's a finished product. Run, bang! <laughs> Everyone just takes off in separate directions. I did. <laughs> Yeah, so, sorry, Dan. Uh, sorry, not sorry. Let's let's look over this list here. We got a few other. Uh, 
Callum Walsh, uh, we'll just knock this one out real quick because I've, I've never read the books, but uh, he says, Artemis Fowl, truly one of the worst adaptations in the history of cinema. Unfortunately, Callum, I don't believe it counts. As, well, like, would it count as cinema, even though it never got a cinematic release? It counts as... I think it was intended to get a, a cinematic release, but then the pandemic happened. Yes, um, I, I think it must be interpreted as cinematic because Sir Kenneth Branagh directed it. And anytime you have Sir Kenneth Branagh, this movie was crap, Matt. I don't know what the hell they did. I think <laughs> I, I personally, my personal opinion is that Disney went to him and said, you're going to make this. You're going to start a franchise for us. And if you do that, we'll let you go make your damn Agatha Christie movies. Okay. Okay. You filmed this and he filmed it and they're like, thank you. And then they saw what they had and went, thank God there's a pandemic. <laughs> <Don't> <laughs> it. And then someone looked over his contract and he went, I, I don't know what's happening. He's just still filming these movies. He just goes somewhere. He films them and we're <laughs> obligated to release them. Listen, the budget is the budget for all three of these films doesn't even approach the budget of Artemis Fowl. Let's just hope we break even and we'll call it and we'll, we'll just let him do his thing. He, he likes the mustache. Okay. We had to apologize <laughs> to him about Thor one and the butchery we do to it. Just let him grow his mustache and go film these little movies, okay? That's personally what yeah, I believe he took happened. A, he took a swing with Thor, and I, I still think that one, it doesn't get the love it deserves. I don't think it's great. Mm -mm. But for a fish-out-of-water story and an introduction to the character of Thor, I, I mean, the only real, like, miss on those swings is the blonde eyebrows. Like, what are you doing? And that can't be placed on him because Kevin Feige has said that that's all on him. That he was like, listen, he has to be blonde like the comics. You have to make him. And he's like, Are you? and Chris Hemsworth and Kenneth Brown were like, okay. And he's like, it, you have to do it, man. Because, <laughs> I mean, blonde people don't have darker eyebrows. Like, that's definitely not a thing. No, never, never. <laughs> but uh, Artemis Fowl, I, we watched because of sh just the name of Brana and God, that was such a bad movie. I mean, how did he trick Judy Dench into this film? How, how, how does he drag her through the mud like that? Judy Dench was in that movie? I don't remember a thing about it. I remember the duck sauce guy from Game of Thrones was in there. That's it. Dar was it Dario Duck Sauce or something? Daxus? The way they kept the way that Khaleesi said his name, she sounded like she was saying duck sauce. So I, I just I call him duck sauce. I, I was fortunate enough to skip this movie entirely i can't even talk about it i saw the previews that kind of flashed like it, like the old straight to dvd things like you may have missed it in theaters because everybody did now you can get your hands on it and i was like mm, miss me with that one dude <laughs> i'm not dialing in it, it continued my my justified hatred of josh gad <laughs> <laughs> he's olaf my justified hatred of josh gad <laughs> 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 All right, Matt, what, uh, no, yeah, Matt, what, what's sticking out to you again? Uh, I'd like to go to the Watchmen movie because we're getting that on the good radar mm -hmm. from somebody named Alex. Yep. Uh, hmm, I wonder who that would be. So I very on the nose. The watch, the Watchmen is an, is a fantastic comic series. You can't go wrong with it. Yeah. If you, take a swing and miss even a little bit you're still in the lane i mean the characters are very well developed and they stayed the course in the movie as well i mean it's i enjoy both sides of the fence and the casting was really good here too anytime you have an anti-hero squad that actually has inner turmoil and it's real to life situations uh like sexual promiscuity uh broken relationships mental health issues i mean you're really seeing all that and then like rorschach psychosis i mean it's this is all a fantastic movie that has several pl plots that are going on simultaneously i think it does a good job of mimicking a comic book series arc with multiple characters while keeping everyone in their lane so i really enjoyed this i enjoyed the books i enjoyed the movie so this is around the nose alex uh, i have nothing to say i, I personally would I would contend I, I would like a, a minor minor point of clarification from you when you say the watchman comic series are you referencing the original run or are you referencing the bullshit firestorm that they released a few years back just to piss off you know uh, alan moore there are two options i didn't know there were two <laughs> options i i 
there, there's if there's a second run, it's it's in the ethers of unknowing to me. It, it's like it's like playing Command and Conquer, and I haven't I haven't had a vehicle go that way yet. I can't unlock that part of the map. So no, of course it's the original run. Okay, see, I like the Watchmen book. I have this is one where I will I will contend that the movie is slightly better than the book in that I think it makes more sense to make Dr. Manhattan the ultimate evil versus a random freaking squid that they drop in once. I think that to me is a more tangible, not so left field uh, turn than just, Oh yeah. Those people we've been kind of in the background murdering off now. And then we're all part of this project to make a dead Amorphous blob that we did threw into a, a nuclear explosion, so that is why I think it actually hits the it makes the assignment, but it improves upon the, the comic book. Because when I every time I read the comic book and I get to this that squid, I'm like, no, it should have been Doctor Manhattan, man. You got to get rid of the Superman. You got to get rid. You got to turn everyone towards the big blue thing. <laughs> And united against something that literally rewrites all of reality as it walks around. I think I think the other part about that too is Doctor Manhattan's complete nihilist outlook. Once he realizes that he's this being that's so far past human comprehension, and he knows that he's superior, and he he kills everything he touches that he loves. He knows that he's destined to be alone. He can be alone in places that other people can't reach when you make him the ultimate evil it's due to complacency complacency of power and that's what makes him so damning also too because of that i've learned everything about nuclear fusion from the watchman so when i went to go see oppenheimer i was so fucking bored i didn't know i was like when does somebody get superpowers <laughs> I know he. They were putting the marbles in the two things. I'm like, okay, one of these smart, one of these is going to happen. Us. Yep. Cool. <laughs> when do I see blue? And is this where the CGI dong comes in, or no? <laughs> definitely, definitely. Is, and I, I had fingers crossed and breath held. I was like, this is it. <laughs> Come on, Killian Murphy, big blue. <laughs> yeah, when I went and saw Watchmen, uh, that's when I looked over at my dad. I'm like, am I allowed to be here? <laughs> He said, would you like to know more? <laughs> Swipe to learn We're going to go to Tijuana. <laughs> uh, so, I, like, I don't hate the Watchmen movies as much as, like, some hardcore comic fanboys do. Uh, I just had a really bad theater-going experience. It's like, I'm not an aggressive person, but the group of people I went with at the time, we almost got into a fight with a group of, and I say this in, in malice, a, a group of nerds behind us because one of the dudes decided he was going to bring the OGN with him or the, the trade paperback, whatever you want to call it. And he was just flipping through. That's different. That's different. That's not the same that no, that frame. Oh, that frame's real good. Zach nailed that frame. And we we're just like, shut up, man. I'm sorry about that, Josh. <laughs> yeah, I know it was you, Alex. <laughs> I just didn't want to out you and talk about how we almost got into a fight 20 not 20 15 years ago yeah i know so i would like to bring up uh, kelly delinkson's uh missed the assignment ready player one and i will completely agree with that because about two and a half minutes into this into that movie i realized that beloved spielberg was the wrong person to be directing this because number one they did change uh, most of the uh most of the puzzles and stuff like that mind you i hate the book i hate it i think it's pretentious i think it's miserable i think it's nerd baiting massaging just garbage but you have a puzzle that people are trying to solve that is a bunch of vr nerd gamers who are doing all these things to get the points to build their cars and motorcycles so they can do try this daily or whatever and it's a race I guarantee you at the end of the first day, one dumbass would have put the car in reverse and just gone backwards because they realized no one can solve this. This is ridiculous. I'm not going to win anyways. I might as well see what's behind me because cause some chaos. 
that's what nerds do. And that is actually what some of us do because the second you know there's a collectible somewhere, from the very first level, you immediately turn around and go see if it's behind you because that's where they have put half the collectibles in video games. It's right behind you because you land somewhere and you're entering the level. And if you turn around and you turn the corner, there it is, and you miss it the first time. Miss the first time, and now good. The one thing I'm missing, I can get 100 percent now. No, I'm sorry. You don't spend 20 years doing this stupid race. All of us growing up in the Oasis, and no one put the freaking car in reverse. <laughs> yeah, that Ready Player One and Space Jam Two are like essentially the same movie. They both suck, and they're both just there to be like, "Hey, did you see the the reference to the thing that I like?" Yeah, I I couldn't agree more. I tried to watch this movie a couple of times, and you know what? I'd rather watch Pixels. I'd rather watch Pixels if I wanted to get my dose of video games in real world plus you get adam sandler which is a little more palatable especially because i'm 37 and i i love happy gilmore so excuse me while i kiss the sky <laughs> uh, rest in peace bob barker <laughs> price is <Indeed>. wrong bitch. <laughs> All right. So while we're going on things of like misogyny and just bad people, uh, another one that missed the assignment for me, um, The Greatest Showman. Hate this movie because of the subject matter. If it was if it was just a whole new character that Hugh Jackman like was inspired by P.T. Barnum because P.T. Barnum noted horrible person. Dude owned a slave in a. in an anti-slavery time, he just, he didn't take care of his people. He was just care. He only was concerned about his money and it just, he was a horrible fucking person. There there's a, I, I pulled it up here just to verify that I was right. The Smithsonian wrote an article about how fucking awful PT Barnum was in response to this movie becoming like, titanic-esque where it released in december and ran in theaters until like april somehow i I mean it's because of the music the music is fantastic like i can't knock the music and that's what hugh jackman was all about with he's trying to revitalize the uh live action musical movies and he decided let's do a pt barnum biopic in a musical form let's not we don't need to romanticize this horrible person let's just make a killer soundtrack and make it about a guy who wants to start a circus easy. It doesn't have to be PT Barnum just because he's a guy that created a circus. Sorry, Hugh Jackman, please do better as Wolverine (laughs) again. (laughs) I got to say though, one of the best things that came out of this is the soundtrack. Most notably panic at the disco go singing the greatest show which then helped brendan yuri become the lead on kinky boots which was the best run of kinky boots that had gone on in a really long time so i'm a huge pan panic at the disco fan love brendan yuri so if anything we got out of this we got that i hate the movie i'm not a huge Hugh jackman fan either but music was pretty dope <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Pink's rendition of A Million Dreams is fantastic as well. So good, yeah. Like, that, that, again, just give Pink that song to release as a single. It doesn't have to be in a movie. I'm trying to now picture, did did he do Kinky Boots before or after MPH? Hmm. I think it was after. Okay, yeah. That one of our first- if only we had some kind of reference tools to to use and look this information up. I don't think we do. That's what I'm saying. If only. Yeah, because I, I, I vividly remember NPH um, doing the Tonys and he comes out singing his song, gyrating against the front row, takes off someone's glasses, licks them all over and then puts them back on their face. And I'm like, God, I wish I was. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> so we have here. uh Hmm. things that are disappointing to bring us back to Watchmen, Rorschach's Jack, uh, Jackie or Haley's Rorschach was fantastic. So much so that they went, you know what? You need to ruin a different franchise. We're going to give you nightmare on Elm street. Now, my problem with the nightmare on Elm street reboot is a few things. One, the makeup, but two, primarily the story. We all know that Mr. Kruger was unfairly tried by a jury of his peers 
Well, a jury of a bunch of people who decided to burn him before trial. Now, well, actually, it was after trial because he was acquitted. Now, there, it's always been ambiguous as to whether or not he actually did it or he was a scapegoat, but that he was in, turned into this twisted being because of the horrors of what happened to him. And eventually, apparently, he got consumed by a dream demon, and there's some really funky lore. I think the majority reason that this misses the mark is instead of some playfulness, some glee, some little bit of touch, we all go to the movies and for to horror movies. Because frankly, we really enjoy watching teenagers get killed for being assholes. And we kind of root for the killer because it's like, you know what? You all but the final girl deserves it. This one strips that all away and just straight up goes, no, he's actually a horrible human being who is torturing and harming all these people. And it just strips the fun and joy. There's no, it's it's misery. It's it's grody. It's disgusting to look at. There's no fun there's no excitement there's no like oh that was a good kill it's it's just it takes all sympathy and apathy and voyeurism away to just give us this gross flaccid drop it's it's gross it's not fun they're 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 trying to have it both ways they're trying to say yeah he did some horrible things but then also go but you like it when he stabs people right no we understand what makes people love these movies the scene where he the it's still in human form and he uh freddy krueger is or frederick krueger mr frederick krueger when he's slow licking the picture and then he puts it in the book that set the tone for this thing to be so gritty that you're right i completely abandoned how i used to feel when I would watch the Nightmare on Elm Street movies where there would be the comedic relief, seeing Robert Englund having a good time ripping Johnny Depp apart by pulling him through a waterbed, like those kind of things. Also, the the voice, why he went full Bruce Wayne in the new DC. Like, <laughs> oh, oh, yo, you bitch. I just, I couldn't, I didn't like it. And then the, uh, the cutoff nose. I know they tried to make it their own. That's what yeah. they were trying to do is make Freddy Krueger their own. However, he's a hallmark horror character. You can make him exactly how he looked with Robert Englund. You just got to make sure you get someone in there who can actually play the part the right way. And you swung and you missed. And the storyline was exactly the same, except you made this guy a true blue child killer. So, yeah, I didn't root for him to kill anybody like I usually do. And you're right. Every single kill too had some massage of CGI to it as well. It mm-hmm. robbed that movie of everything that it could have been. And that's why you haven't seen another one yet because yeah. someone's trying to figure it the fuck out. <laughs> mm-hmm. What about you, Josh? What do you got going on? Uh, we got another double submission from a friend of the show, Josh Wilson from super familiar with the Wilsons. He said uh, the 2019 Aladdin as well as Percy Jackson movies, which I mean, the 2019 Aladdin, you can just encompass that with live action Disney movies. And it's not necessarily <laughs> that they missed the assignment. It's that they hit the assignment too well. I think like what what they do is they're like, let's put a real world spin on these animated features and it's not interesting and they also do the star wars thing where they fill in plot holes like it's it's burned into my brain the the moment where bell talks to a hairbrush and lumiere is like uh you dumb bitch that's a that's a hairbrush and she's like oh okay and yet there's a deleted scene apparently of a toilet being alive i'm not you got to have some toilet humor for the kids <laughs> they go, i want to eat your poop <laughs> Let me eat your <laughs> It's a living. <laughs> yeah, the less said about the Aladdin movie, the better. Which I am so glad that uh it seems like Disney has very quietly brushed under the rug the announcement of the Gaston uh LaFou spin-off miniseries. It's been four years and the writer and you know everyone's on strike, so I'm assuming it's gone. Yeah, just trash it. Like, talk about missing an assignment. Like, Luke Evans is not an unhandsome man. Like, he is a beautiful man. Mm-hmm. He's not Gaston. No. He literally sings a line about how he's roughly the size of a barge. And I'm pretty sure, aside from the height difference, I'm about as big as Luke Evans. Like, maybe not as muscular or toned, but I think I might be 
a little bit thicker than him. Yep. So I'm a bigger barge than he is, if he's a barge <laughs> at all. You know who they should have had for that? Hugh Jackman. Go. He's too old. <laughs> too old. It Sorry. would work. It would it would work because he he's oh, man. in love with her like, anyway. Uh, so Tom Hardy. Get Tom Hardy out there. You just get Tom Hardy for every single role that <laughs> you need a muscular white guy that can speak multiple languages. Tom Hardy. There you go. Boom. Yeah, but in. <laughs> again, feel like too old. Well, no, they'd have to change the line. He'd be roughly the size of a tugboat. <laughs> <laughs> They're landlocked, though. Would he know what a tugboat is? <laughs> <laughs> so the Percy Jackson movies, I watched those movies and I found them kind of cute and endearing in a knockoff way of, you know, oh, yeah, it's the 75th attempt to take on the Harry Potter franchise and create something. And then I read the books and I was like, oh, wow. OK, so <laughs> this really was a swing and a miss because I burned through those books and like, no, no, like probably two months at one point i was just like oh, oh wow. wow they're quick easy reads they're fun they're good blah blah they're kind of dark they're kind of twisted they're kind of screwed up oh okay cool they keep going oh and i got to the end i was like oh cool and then someone's like oh he they did another one it's like more like roman mythology or like other mythologies i'm like oh cool and then i went i'm good at 12 you know <laughs> put the books aside. <laughs> but they were they were i they're fine for being harmless but as adaptations yeah they they just they there's a reason why they kind of puttered and went, Meep. we'll stop it too. Yeah, it's the, uh, we have Harry Potter at home idea. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The wish.com version of Harry Potter. <laughs> is pretty, yeah. Yeah. All right, Matt, what's sticking out to you? Well, if I could go ahead and dip back into my childhood when I was very excited to see this movie start up, uh, Godzilla in 98. <laughs> Josh, you've chosen that one as something that misses the mark, and I couldn't agree more. Godzilla was the reason why I would fake sick in elementary school to stay home when the sci-fi channel would run the Godzilla marathons randomly <laughs> because like ratings are down. We yep. got to do something. Show every single Godzilla movie and getting lost in the, the oversized battles when Godzilla was the villain. Then he was the anti-hero. Then he took on Mothra. I mean, fantastic movies, fun and schlocky. Really enjoyed that. Then all of a sudden, I have to worry about Puff Daddy singing some song that goes along with this thing, and they're ripping apart Cashmere, and I I couldn't stand this movie for the life of me. Matthew Broderick could not save this movie as much as he possibly tried. I did go to theaters to see it, unfortunately, and I can't go back and change that mistake. But what I can do is sit here on this podcast and take a shit on it, which I will do. The CGI was terrible. The acting was terrible and making him some lovable creature that can get down on matthew broderick's level to make eye contact with him pass the movie was terrible not worth going back it's it's like uh the hulk the first hulk that came in the early 2000s it's there you can watch it if you wanna you don't have to you probably shouldn't but you just know that it's it's been done it's it's in canon it's somewhere out there just don't don't fuck with it <laughs> I remember going to see that in theaters as well. Um, my sister took me. She's like, oh, we're, my, my boyfriend and I are going to go see this. Do you want to join us? She's like, I love action movies. I was wanting to see that. There's that Taco Bell commercial with the dog riding the Godzilla's tail. Like, yeah, let's do this. And I, I came home and I was like, I'm going to go watch South Park. <laughs> yeah. The best part of that movie was, yes, the Yokedo Taco Bell. Because <laughs> that that little that little chihuahua just really, really wanted some Taco Bell and then just really wanted to catch the lizard. Eh, lizard, lizard, lizard. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say the best part in terms of the movie is actually its soundtrack because that is a banging soundtrack, but also because Rage Against the Machine was paid to write a song to put on this and has a line in the song, and I quote, Godzilla, pure motherfucking filler. <laughs> <laughs> they shit on their movie <laughs> that they're just contractually obligated to put out the song for. They took that check, they cashed that check, and then gave a middle finger as they walked out of the studio. <laughs> Thank you, Zach De La Roca. <laughs> Hell yeah. Remember the part where they put out a lot of fish and Matthew Broderick was like, it's a lot of fish. <laughs> <sighs> Roland Emmerich humor, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> They were writing the back of Independence Day so hard for this movie. 
they they had 50 years of Godzilla designs and they wanted to create their own so much so that they pissed off Japan that in the next Godzilla movie released in Japan, he the Godzilla kills that version of it. <laughs> yeah, even the animated series that they created based off of this movie, they use one of the babies that hatched from the eggs and then they created Mecha Godzilla with this movie's Godzilla and killed it. <laughs> yep. I mean, say what you will about the the new MonsterVerse ones. That Godzilla looks badass. Oh, I love that oh, Godzilla. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's really cool. Which is one of the it, reasons it, why it, I'm I'm tempted to go see the creator is because I love Gareth Edwards. He does a great job mm-hmm. with scale. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, Alex, we're getting down to the nitty gritty in terms of time and our list. What's what's popping out for you? Josh, I, I, I want to go to the mat on this, but I can't because I honestly, everything you say, absolutely 100% everything you say will in fact be accurate, be true, and will be wonderful. And I cannot deny it. I cannot defend it. But I will say this. League of Extraordinary Gentlemen is such a is such a guilty pleasure. It is so stupid. It is oh, yeah, so it, bad. I, it is it missed the mark one thousand percent. But I I love that the way that they captured the Invisible Man is by like throwing water on him and then like putting a sack on him and just beating the shit out of him for being a, <laughs> for being a creep. <laughs> <laughs> I love uh what is it the um the vampire lady where she goes to uh, to Sean Connery's character and she's like wow all those books on your shelves that you've read just by their cover <laughs> it's such just a be it's I, seeing the nautilus for the first time to rise out is just fun but the fucked up like car that they drive around in and uh, the Jekyll I, they did the Jekyll Hyde thing right it's not a good m- movie why is Tom Sawyer in this? Yes, I know why Tom Sawyer is in this. He's in the goddamn <laughs> comics. I get it. And Tom Sawyer, apparently, Sean Connery followed him and abandoned him because, I mean, that's just what he does. But, you know, it, I love this crappy movie. It's terrible. It's not good, but I love it. Yeah, this is another one of those great examples of why you should not adapt. Alan Moore works is it it works in the medium it works in. It's not necessarily adaptable. But it is fun bad. Like, it's one of those movies that you're like, I feel like watching something real shitty that I'm going to laugh at. And they were trying to take it seriously. And that's LXG as they tried to rebrand it. (laughs) This is also the movie that Sean famously forced Sean Connery into retirement. Uh, But he also took this movie because he passed on The Matrix, if I remember correctly. He didn't understand the script. He's like, I don't get it. I'm not find someone else and then the matrix went on to become the matrix and he's like okay well i have this script in front of me i don't get this i didn't get the matrix so clearly this must be the next great thing and (laughs) i am so sorry sean that is half right it was actually the third time's the charm he was thinking because he passed on the matrix as you said but then he was also offered gandalf and 10 percent of the gross and he as well went, I don't understand this shit. And I don't want to spend 18 months in New Zealand. That's why he, he could have made it. friends with a young Taika Waititi. <laughs> <laughs> so, he yeah, could have I, been in what we do in the shadows. That would have been fantastic. I want to live in that universe. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, so it was a third time the I don't understand it charm and it did not work. And also, the director of this movie hasn't worked since either. <laughs> Shocked. Shocker. Shocker. <laughs> I can only imagine, like, yeah, someone must, like, have a vendetta and be like, you forced Connery into retirement. <laughs> you shall never work again. <laughs> well, I mean, Hollywood's all based on your prior work. So, like, they don't want to be like, from the guy who brought you LXG. <laughs> and then everyone going, what's LXG? And then looking it up and going like, oh, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh poor guy I mean on paper you look at that movie and you're like this is going to be cool like if you look at it on paper at a summary without a table read you're like this is going to be a lot of fun and then you get the first day on the set and you're like why am I here what am I sp- I'm fighting tennis balls is this supposed to be okay in post production that's going to be a werewolf oh, okay mm. <laughs> To, to, to loop that in, I mean, that's what happened with The Hobbit. I mean, there is a famous story of Ian McKellen 
on set crying and saying this is not why i became an actor because they did everything green screen this time because they were rushing through just trying to finish this damn thing and that is actually like a small snippet of i believe it has actually leaked in either behind the scenes footage or something like that but he was so pissed and so angry at this movie that he that peter jackson made ian mckellen cry and how dare you how dare you <laughs> i will maintain that the hobbit is good through the first like 30 to 40 minutes until you, bilbo gets on the pony like once bilbo gets on the pony it's all downhill mm-hmm. but everything leading up to the the gathering and through the gathering and the the party the song all that is fantastic mm-hmm and it's all done mostly practically besides the stupid, like we're throwing CGI plates around that are supposedly China, but we're just bouncing them off each other and doing crazy things where these should break. But because it's CGI, we can do whatever the hell we want. Uh, so like, I'll, I'll forgive some of that kind of like the first like 20 minutes of the Phantom Menace. I think really good Star Wars stuff in the first 20 minutes of the Phantom Menace. And then Jar Jar shows up and George Lucas will not let him shut the hell up. If Jar Jar just didn't talk, I think Phantom Menace would be a lot better. But Jar Jar talks all the time. Like you said, it's good up until that scene. And I think, I wonder how much of that was just the script that Guillermo del Toro left them. Because they do keep giving him story by credits because they, they, they took his foundation and his notes and they massaged the crap out of that and then shoved in filler to hit three movies. So I do wonder how much of it was that. But once they leave it's just like everything's gone hope joy practical effects just gone and then you have i don't know what the heck did orlando bloom actually film like one day on set and then leave and they just kind of like had a stand-in that they put like a waxy mask on because i hate that face eye shine gloss they give him it's so distractingly bizarre it's like he went, oh my gosh, it's been 10 years since we filmed the last movies and you have two crow's feet. I think we need to do something about that. <laughs> Let's go digital. It just doesn't work. And then you have Lego Mario jumping off of blocks. and I don't mind that. I think that's fine. It's not as epic as they want it to be, but yeah. I, I'm more like, why do we need to add in the storyline? Is it Toriel is her name? Uh, yeah. with the other dwarf where she's like why does it hurt so much it was love it was real y- you knew him for two hours shut mm-hmm. the hell up that's like ariel and the the little in the fir- in the original 1989 little mermaid where she's like i love him like i'm 16 i'm not a child girl mm-hmm. go learn some stuff i was offended that they had her fall for the one um conventionally attractive dwarf one of the ones with all like the beating in his in his in his hair, you know, have her like have the opposites attracting. Like I am tall and hairless and an elf. What are you, little hairy thing? <laughs> you know, go weird with it, man. If you're adding a character, give us some weird fetishes. You're saying she needs to chubby chase Bomber. Hell yeah! <laughs> well, rolling Tom Bombadil. Stuff. <laughs> Getting some feet stuff. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And you know what? If you have, you know, cucumber bumper batch there on set, <laughs> have him do some weird stuff too. No, don't just make him. Have smog. you not seen the behind the scenes footage stuff of him being smog? Like he's done, he's doing some weird shit. I know, and they should have taken that mocap and continued it, and like and done some really weird stuff. I mean, oh. I'm talking like have turn that into the horses. <laughs> yeah, also, Halliburton pumpkin patches like. He's a commodity. You really want to make sure that you're used to mm-hmm. his fullest extent. <laughs> also, they needed to fix Bard because the character design they went for him. I didn't know who Luke Evans was at the time. And I just thought mm-hmm. they'd gave Orlando Bloom dual roles. They just went like, oh, they put him in the Will. Uh, they put him in the Will Turner makeup and we're just like, here, Orlando, you can have a day without the wig. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they did some weird stuff in these movies. The original the original trilogy not the prequel trilogy 
they all the behind the scenes stuff is so fun to watch because everyone's having fun and being weird and they're down there like trapped for like 18 months doing this fun stuff and they filmed short movies and did all this fun stuff and it was joyish and you know you get all these cutesy little stories like peter jackson would walk walk by and encourage um and encourage samwise to eat more because he wanted a plumper sam and all of these like weird things like because you kind of watch it you see that he kind of gains weight throughout the movie <laughs> but this one you look at all the behind the scenes stuff and nobody wants to be there nobody's happy there's no cutesy stories it is all just it's just obligation and then sorrow and that's disappointing yeah, I know she has some baggage about her right now, but Lindsay Ellis has a really great expose on the the Hobbit movies. Say what you will about her, but this, I, I would say at least check out those videos about the Hobbit movies and how they essentially destroyed the local uh, economy for where they filmed those movies. I, and I will bring back to something happy. I was really happy to see that the pie maker continued his, continued getting work after that. Because Lee Pace is a treasure, and he should be loved, ador- uh, adoring. <laughs> and frankly, him riding up in his battle moose is one of the funniest fucking things I've ever seen in my life, <laughs> and I love it. <laughs> All right, let's let's go one more each. Um, I'm gonna end on a positive note. Uh, I'm gonna say Kim's Convenience. We haven't talked a lot of TV adaptations. Uh, Kim Convenience. Kim's Convenience is ad- adapted from a stage play. Uh, it's basically a biopic from the scriptwriter, screenwriter, uh, creator. I think it's just a really fun show that's very, it, it takes a lot of the sitcom stuff, but it does character growth. And uh, I, I think it is very respectful in a lot of what it does, showing a, a migrant family trying to make its way through Toronto. And uh, it, it's just a great show that I would strongly recommend anyone watch. I think the entire series is on Netflix. It does end a little prematurely because the pandemic hit when they had a mid season finale, I believe. And then the creator just went, I'm done. Like I'm not, we're not going to start back up again. So it just kind of ends abruptly because among other things, Simu Liu got cast as Shang Chi. So he now has a big Marvel contract and he wasn't sure what his availability will be, but apparently Marvel doesn't know what his availability is either. Cause they haven't done shit with him since 2020. Matt, what are you going to end with? So the one that I kept I kept looking on this list here is from uh, Lee Valentine's The Shining. Uh, she said that uh, missed the brief, but was all the better for it. Uh, I agree. I agree. Uh, the Shining as a as a book as a novel has a lot to to pick through. I mean, you really got to get into some development here and exposition. And I feel like the movie tried to take away some of the the slogging and fill it in with some more atmospheric horror. And that's where you get some, a lot of those iconic scenes, like the blood from the elevator, the twins on the carpet, uh, the typewriter scene. Uh, And of course, spoilers, you haven't watched it yet. I don't know what the hell you're waiting for, but the very end, whenever um, the lead character, Jack Nicholson is playing is now in the, uh, the photo of the bar as it zooms out. So you just, the, the ever engrossing hotel taking people over and changing them i know it gets it's it gets you know kicked around a little bit for some of the things that happened here and some of the things that happened on set people being tortured a little bit to get more into their roles and i heard it been like oh it's method acting or whatever it might be all i know is the shining is a fantastic movie it's definitely worth having in your rotation of seasonal horror movies it's a great way to bring people into horror because it kind of plays on a bunch of different tropes and does it pretty well. I think it, it hits the mark by leaving some things that Stephen King put in behind while putting some new things in from like a Wes Anderson kind of situation. The symmetry of the the cinematography, uh, the atmospheric pressure you feel on the family, they feel so isolated. And the only person that can come out there and save them gets axed in the first five minutes they hit the grounds of the hotel. I really enjoy that movie. I think it was a really good pick to see something that hit the mark. Uh, I do enjoy it. Dr. Sleep, however, no. That's for another podcast. So, The Shining, yay. (laughs) Matt. Yeah, hi. What's wrong with Dr. Sleep? (laughs) Huh? What's wrong with it? Oh, just everything. Okay, good, good, good. (laughs) I respect that. And I will 
take this battle offline. Josh, as the judge, I need a 20 minute recess or perhaps a two week podcast recess to prepare my legal arguments against Matt for Dr. Sleep. Sure, we can relitigate uh, if we can't watch thank the you. creator. Okay, thank you. Now, <clears throat> I am going to go slightly off script. Cause... Not allowed. Ah, shit. Okay, never mind. <laughs> Overruled. Uh... <laughs> Overruled. That's the word. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Then I'm going to go with one that just makes me laugh my ass off. I completely agree with movie Matt as serious. Clash of the Titans slash Wrath of the Titans. Completely 130,000% missed the mark on remaking it. It was during the time right after uh, Avatar when they were looking for big budget CGI movies. And they thought that um, Sam Worthington was the next hot shit in Hollywood. Because... Famously, he hates uh, Beepo, uh, the little flying bird owl. And he had them rewrite the script to not include it. <laughs> and so that's why in the movie you see him pick it up and then like chuck it to the side. And it's like, how freaking dare you? Now, I contend that the first movie has some bright spots. It is cutesy. It is kind of fun. Uh, seeing, seeing, ah, oh, crap, what's his name? Zeus. Who's played Zeus in that? Liam Neeson. Thank you. Seeing Liam Neeson and Voldemort be brothers is fantastic. That is fun. I mean, we got the icon, uh, the seemingly iconic release, the Kraken line, <laughs> which was great. The Medusa part was fun. There was some good stuff in that first movie, but it's still not as good as stop motion 1960s Wrath of the Titan, uh, Clash of the Titans. Agreed. So I'm looking over the the cast list here because I I was like I got to make sure I get her right her name right because Io is played by Gemma Arterton which I believe this mm -hmm. is like her first leading role she was Strawberry Fields in um, Casino Royale or not Casino Royale uh, Quantum of Solace I believe but also Luke Evans is in this movie there seems to be a common thread here I was wondering if you would notice that and it's Luke Evans <laughs> Mads Mikkelsen is also in here as Draco. Mm -hmm. Look up Dracula Untold, a an attempt to create a monster verse before they tried Tom Cruise's version. Oh, I am I am very familiar with Dra Dracula <laughs> Untold, um, if for no other reason because one of my favorite more not indie podcasts, uh, the Weekly Planet, created an, a whole segment based around that movie because the end credits scene has the game is on line, where mm -hmm. um uh what the hell's his name um Vlad the Impaler. Sure. Um, He's the oh, dad of Charles Dance. Yes, Charles Dance. Charles Dance uh, sees Luke Evans, Dracula in the future. And he's like, oh, the game is on. And no, no, it's not. No one's seeing this movie and you're not getting a sequel. So uh, James and Mason of the Weekly Planet have the game is on awards, which is they hand out uh, a meaningless award that is just for them uh, for movies that try to tease a sequel that will never happen. <laughs> And who was Vlad the Impaler in that movie? Charles Dance? No, Luke. No. Oh, Luke I thought Evans. I thought Vlad the Impaler was Dracula. No, sorry. Or Luke Evans no. was Dracula. Yeah, Luke Evans is Dracula, Vlad the Impaler. Oh, they're, they're the same person. Charles, that's right. Yeah, sorry. Charles Dance is just called the Master. You know, Got it. They basically caught him in a um, caught him on set of Game of Thrones when he was in a cave and said, "Hey, can you film a few lines for us?" <laughs> and he went, "I don't have to change my clothes." Sure. <laughs> but oh, man, I I I liked Clash of the Titans because it was kind of stupid fun. But I think what I knew where Wrath of the Titans was just terrible was when Zeus and Hades big fight scene is them wandering across a barren landscape, occasionally throwing a hand and like a lightning bolt comes out and like some ghouls come out. And it's just like you guys didn't even try. I want to see Zeus in Hades using the last of their powers and abilities because they're pushing this off because they know that the time of the gods is over. Release your power and manifestation and do something epic, not bzzzed. Bzzzed. They ran out of budget because they <laughs> had to convert it to 3D because of Avatar. That is actually very freaking accurate because that both of those movies were post-production 3, uh, 3D. Yeah. Uh, Dracula Untold, I forgot that was um, 
a universal movie and that was part of their like six or seven year push of trying to create their own shared universe of the public domain monsters Mm -hmm. which again missed assignment tom cruise is the mummy (laughs) let the games begin (laughs) johnny depp was going to be the invisible man which seemed weirdly like why would you cast anyone to be the invisible man shouldn't you and like what was the point of that connected universe like if you're doing a connected universe you're building towards like a team up. What are they teaming these guys up for? Hotel Transylvania. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say Abbott and Costello. <laughs> <laughs> the mightiest foes. <laughs> I would actually, that would actually be an interesting movie. Uh, Who framed Roger Rabbit part two. And it is the live action universal monster <laughs> monster <laughs> movies against hotel transylvania <laughs> yes and then there's oh. a dueling scene of mickey mouse at the piano <laughs> with, with, with track <laughs> they're playing the piano against each other aha <laughs> uh-huh. i like i like the way you tickle the ivory's track oh mm-hmm. yes i like the way you trickle them too <laughs> <laughs> Uh, as long as you had to conclude Betty Boop in there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> See, I was going to go with a serious answer and say Cthulhu because I knew that would get a, a reaction at least out of Alex. Yes, <laughs> there he is. He threw his hands up. Uh, let me just reach down here <laughs> off mic and pull out my Call of Cthulhu rule book. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, they I'm did sorry. make a good, there was a good Cthulhu movie made uh, called Underwater starring Kristen Stewart. Which again, another movie for another time. That was a very, actually, I really like that movie. That was a really good movie. Yeah, very again, very atmospheric and uh, basically, um, what if Cloverfield but underwater and Cthulhu, and the monster looked good, not just like yeah. a weird mm-hmm. air sac monster. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and, but, and it hit the assignment. <laughs> <laughs> yes they did they did nail the assignment so with that we're going to start wrapping up here because we're hit i'm sure even after edits we're going to be close to the 90 minute mark but, so it's gonna be a longer episode for us and for you but we thank you for listening uh matt please let everyone know where they can find you and about your podcast one last time oh wonderful we are a dynamic duo of decaying with the boys we are at decay and wtb on all social media facebook instagram twitter now known as x threads tiktok youtube and all the other social media platforms i can get my hands on don't forget about our Gmail account, KNWTB on gmail.com, or you can send in any kind of request, or you can mock me as much as you possibly want to. Subscribe to our YouTube whenever you can, and if you can do that, maybe we can increase all the things we put on our Redbubble store where you can get all your fun t-shirts to endorse my show. So again, to KNWTB on all social media, and thank you so much uh, to the Talking Smack crew for allowing me to come on. Like I said, this is one of my favorite podcasts to listen to. I'm a fan. So I get to fan out and be a part of this. So I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, we, we thank you for coming out because this is a lot of fun. And obviously you're welcome back anytime. Thanks again also to everyone for listening to our massive month bonus interview episodes. Uh, as this episode comes out, the Kyle Higgins episode should have just come out. Uh, we just appreciate the support. And uh, uh, Matt, uh, Matt, talking smack, Matt. And I really want to focus a lot on comics uh, as we go forward, just because I feel like that's a medium that we keep kind of drifting away from because it's so niche, but it's wild. And there's some really good stuff. And uh, if you if you feel like comics are too out there or too unapproachable, look at indie stuff. Uh, As we've talked about the massive verse. Yeah, there are like six books invested in that series and that franchise, whatever you want to call it but you don't have to read all of them. You can find one that works for you. And you, there's the, the only book, the most issues in a single book right now is 26 issues. As this episode comes out, others have like 15, 11 or yeah, 11 and five. So there's, there's not a lot to read. It's not overwhelming and there's not a whole bunch of lore. So again, anyone who has any interest hit us up on all of our social medias or join our discord. The link is in the episode description. You can find us at Talking Smack Pod on all the social media platforms, Blue Sky, Instagram, Threads, Hive Social, Post News, Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, and Lonnie's website. Email us any thoughts, questions, concerns, or suggestions about like stuff you want to have covered. If you're a creator and you want to have something uh, talked about on the show, you want to do an interview, please email us at tsmackpod at gmail.com. Thank you to Leo Allen for our musical themes. 
Alex, who is remixing the theme this week? Someone we've been passively referencing this entire episode, Robin Dijuadi. He did Iron Man. He did Clash of the Titans. He did Game of Thrones. He did Pacific Rim. He did Warcraft. Holy crap, this dude like has written everything I've liked in the last like 20 years. How did I not know this? <laughs> I mean, yes, Game of Thrones is fire, but I didn't realize he did Pacific Rim. That is a banger. Oh, he also did Dracula and told. <laughs> That's actually how I found him. <laughs> I was like, who did the music for? What the hell? <laughs> Thank you to Beppo for our original avatars, Retro Studios for our Ricky avatar. Please like, subscribe, rate, review. Please uh, review on your podcatcher of choice because that helps the podcast get out there and it expands us into the uh, ever loving algorithm or never loving in our case sometimes. But again, thanks so much everyone for listening. Take care. Watch Star Trek. Loves tea smack. I love tea smack. Is it true? Mm-hmm. I do, I do. Ooh.